<laughs> right. Uh, hi, Singapore JS. Um, my name is Chiken. I'm from the Malton Consulting Group. So currently, um, I actually don't use JavaScript very much for my day-to-day -day work because they require me to use another language, which is JavaScript slice 04. Um, despite that, I use it for my own pet projects, right? So when I heard recently that this thing came out of, well, okay, it's not, it's not out of experimental zone yet. It's not, an, it's not out of experimental API stage yet. But we can actually now do proper concurrency in Node.js, right? We can actually spawn threads. So what I've tried to do is actually rewrite some of um, some microservices, right? At, the, at this large stock exchange that I work at currently, right? So let's take a look. What do I mean by concurrency in Node.js? Uh, just a quick quiz. How many of these functions yield control back to the main thread immediately? straight after calling them, right? How many, how many would say the first one, right? Straight after you call HTTP get, the main thread gets back control. Well, okay, I mean, if, if your main thread doesn't get back control straight after a HTTP get request, then we're in trouble, right? Every time you make a, a get request to some other API server, your main thread is gonna get blocked. Uh, how about write file? Same thing, okay? So console log is a bit controversial, okay? This thing is synchronous now, but some time ago, the, the implementation is not standard. So you might see asynchronous versions of it. I don't know. Uh, set immediate, same thing. Uh, your set timeout, set immediate, these things, uh, even process next thing. All, so actually all these functions except for console log, they yield control back to the main thread. This is asynchronicity. Right, so uh, let me skip ahead a few slides. So asynchronicity is like this. So just some background for JavaScript, whatever, whatever, uh, whatever that we write runs, although you know, we say single threaded, it runs in this thread over here in the JavaScript thread. Any IO operation uh, or certain native modules like bcrypt runs in its own separate thread pool managed by the libuv uh, ASIO library. Okay, that's written in C++. So that's asynchronicity, which means that if you end up doing something like this, that's gonna block, okay? So this is a simple loop. It's just going to increment a number up to 10 to the power of eight, and then after that console log, it's gonna block. What happens if you decide to be smart? Okay, I don't want it to block. Let me just put it inside an asynchronous function. Let me just put it inside, wrap it in a promise. And then I'm going to call that promise Sorry, I'm going to call that function, run async. I'm going to say, okay, in this promise, resolve with the 10,000th prime, and after that, console log the prime out. Will hello talk JS appear before or after the, the prime? Before? After, right? It actually appears after the prime, because even though you wrap that thing up in a promise, this is not an IO operation. So imagine Node.js is, what's it gonna do? Which driver is it gonna call? Sorry, which library is it gonna call to actually handle the processing? It's not gonna call libuv, this is not an IO operation. Okay, so Node.js, poor thing, has to handle itself. It's gonna block. And as a result of that, the, con uh, the hello talk JS line only comes after your prime. This is a little bit trickier. I'm going to call the same function, run async on that promise, and then I'm gonna call the same function again after that promise uh, resolves, then I console log the result. So in this case, when does hello talk JS appear? It, yeah, it actually appears after the first promise resolves, right? And then it console logs the prime after that. So it kind of appears in the middle of this in the middle of this chain. Okay, so we've seen asynchronicity. Uh, well. When might this not work? Uh, much of what we do in backend work is actually what we call ETL, right? You extract some data, you transform it, and then you load it or you save it somewhere. So Node.js is really good for the extraction and the, the loading part, right? Your database operations is gonna tell whichever database driver you have, go save this or go retrieve this. I'll be down here servicing other HTTP requests while, while you are doing your stuff, and that's fine. 
But what happens to the T in the middle, the transforming part? If that starts to take too much time in Node.js, it's going to block the thread, right? So where this becomes a problem is if you have, uh, if you have messages coming from a queue, ordinarily when the rate of arrival of messages is, is fairly slow, it's fine. You, extra, you extract one message, uh, your Node.js guy on the right takes a message, does stuff with it, saves it, it's fine. And what happens if you have a highly distributed system and you get many, 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 many messages in a queue? Then you start to form, um, you start to get this back pressure, right? Then you have to make decisions, what to do about the messages that are now stuck. Do I discard them? May not be very good, right? But what else can I do with them? How can I handle them? Uh, wouldn't it be good then if you know you have a lot of you have a lot of producers or messages on the left? Maybe I can have more Node.js uh, workers on the right. So actually, we've been able to do this for a while. Uh, if you are familiar with something called PM2, Process Manager, you actually spawn new uh, you actually spawn new Node.js processes. You can do the same using the cluster uh, module in Node.js. It's a Node Core library. But the thing about processes is that it's really, really heavy. Okay, how it looks like, uh, we've always been able to do this, right? So like I said, if you use the cluster module, you can fork a child process, and then you can send, you can send data between processes. Uh, but if you're on the front end, then this is equivalent to opening a new browser uh, window each time you want to surf to a, a different web page, right? No one does that these days, right? So this is a very expensive way to parallelize operations. Uh, I'm not sure if I have a demonstration here. Can it capture that? Is, is that big enough? Uh, so just to show you how, just to show you how uh, expensive this can get, let me run this particular script. Uh, Note counting, sorry. I forgot to check what's my upper limit first. Okay, so this will look like this. Uh, can you guys see it? So in this little script here, I'm just gonna create two processes and I'm going to count all the way up to, in this process, um, what's my upper limit? With two workers, I'm just aiming to count up to 10 to the power of four, which is just 10,000. Let's see how long that takes. It takes four seconds to just increment that thing up to, well, okay, 100,000 here, right? This is a clustered count. Okay. Um, so that's what happens if you, if you try to communicate between different processes. Just to give you an idea of how slow that actually is, if I were to do this instead, this is just a simple count. It's only 100 milliseconds to count all the way up to, I think this is like 10 to the power of eight. This is in a single thread, just everything locally. Okay, uh, in just that one process, one thread. Right, so let's not speak of bounty processing here from now on, because we're gonna see this new thing, uh, multi-threading. Right, so this is analogous to web workers in the front end. You can spawn worker, uh, worker threads they still run a separate instance of uh, Node.js and its own event, uh, its own e libuv event loop. So there is still a high degree of isolation. Normally threads still cannot access each other's variables unlike um, in other languages, but you can still pass messages between them. Unfortunately, the default API is still post message, post message, post message. It's, it's really, really primitive, right? You can post messages from one thread to another, from the, the main thread to the, the worker thread. Uh, and then you want to get anything back, you get the worker thread to post the message back again. Um, the good thing is, it's already much faster right now than it was, I think about four months ago or so. When I first tried this out, actually this API was about as slow as what you saw just now with the, with the cluster fork example. But right now, if I were to run it, uh, I have a similar example here. So if I run npm counting, 
where was mine? Counting threaded. Instead of four seconds, it should take, yeah, it takes three seconds. <laughs> hey, it's still about 25% faster. Still faster, okay? It's, but really, post messages. Okay, uh, another way to pass data around is when you spawn the worker thread, you can spawn it with some data to begin with. And uh, the main, I, I don't know if you can see here, but in the constructor for the worker here, I've actually passed in this uh, worker data something, right? And that string something actually goes into the worker thread, um, okay, over here. This is the script for the worker thread. I uh, kind of gotten lazy and put the, the entire script as a string and pass the entire string into the, the worker thread to be evaluated, which is what the eval true option here says. Okay, so when the, uh, when the worker thread spawns, it's gonna take this string and it's gonna evaluate it as JavaScript. And when it evaluates it, it imports the worker data, which is this string with a value of something, all right? So that's one way to, uh, sorry, that's another way to pass information to a worker thread. But this is a bit limiting, okay? To be frank, it doesn't actually solve the uh, performance problem because the, the whole point Sorry, the whole problem with, the, with performance when it comes to posting messages to and fro is that each time you do that, if you're posting, say, a, a very large uh, JavaScript object, V8 has to serialize the thing. You're effectively calling JSON stringify on whatever you're posting to the, the thread, and then you're passing it through the, well, worker threads don't really use a socket, but you're, you're basically passing a stringified version of, of the thing. And if you're gonna pass the message back from the worker thread, you're gonna call JSON stringify on it again, effectively, okay? You don't need to do that. JavaScript, Node.js actually clones it for you, but then it's gonna serialize it and pass it across to the, uh, to the thread. It's actually the same thing with, with worker data. So if you're gonna spawn a, a thread with the data, well, it's gonna serialize it, pass it to the worker thread uh, at, at construction time. Still, you've moved this little performance hit to when the worker thread um, is created. So if you are smart about it, you can actually live with it because your server is gonna run for a very long time. You can spawn all your threads at the, at the beginning and you can just keep reusing it, right? Using a thread pool, okay? Um, I might have neglected to mention it, but threads are actually still not very lightweight when it comes to spawning. You can see a noticeable performance hit if you keep spawning threads constantly. Okay. And I think as of the middle of last year, there is actually another way to, to share data. But this comes at a very high cost. Not a performance cost. Actually, out of all the methods of sharing uh, data between threads, this is the fastest. When I talk about, when I talk about cost here, I mean cost of, uh, in terms of complexity. Because what happens now is that um, the script for the worker for the worker thread is up here in red. It's uh, highlighted here. But when I spawn it, I'm going to spawn it with this thing called a uh, a buffer, a shared array buffer. There are array buffers and there are shared array buffers. Shared array buffers are basically regions of memory that you can share between threads, so that multiple threads can actually see what's in the buffer. They can access. They can change what's in the buffer. All right. And the way you do that is you create a buffer and then you create a typed array uh, over it. So in here, I'm using uh, in32 array, 32-bit integer. Uh, there's a very good reason for using 32-bit integers. If you're working with strings, you might want to use an uh, uint8 array instead, because that's what strings uh, normally serialize to if you use utf8 encoding. Um, but in32 arrays actually allows us to use a certain other method, a certain other function that we'll see in a short while. Okay, to, to control, to orchestrate the different threads. So what's going on here? Oh, actually you can already see one of the functions here. Um, so, okay, I'm passing the data view, I'm passing this array, which is a view over the shared buffer into the worker. I'm spawning the worker, so the worker spawns uh, and immediately imports the worker data, which is the shared array buffer and the data view. I'm just referring to the data view as data view. And this function, atomics weight, 
comes from uh, comes from the atomics class. It basically tells the thread to wait on this uh, typed array if the value at index zero, which is the second argument here, okay, has the uh, value zero, which is the third argument. So since I spawn the since I spawn the uh, shared array buffer and I didn't do anything with it. By default, all the values are zero. Um, so this thread is going to wait. It's not going to actually proceed to this console log over here. Meanwhile, what's happening in the main thread is that I'm calling a set timeout, and over here, after one second, I'm going to set the value at the zeroth index to 1337. After doing that, then I call atomics notify. Okay, I'm going to notify any thread that is watching the data view array at index zero, and I'm going to wake up exactly one thread. If you don't specify the one here by default, it wakes up all the threads that are, uh, that are waiting on it. All right. So once I call this, you will see that then the console log goes ahead, and you will see one three three seven. All right. So this is how you can actually pass data to and fro between threads without actually going through post message. It's actually really, really fast in this way. Um, but like I said, this performance comes at a great cost la, because I don't know how many, uh, how many of you have ever stayed late into the nights because your programs ended up, doing some, uh, ended up exhibiting some bug which sometimes happens, sometimes doesn't happen. All right, it's very fun. Race conditions. Sorry, not fun at all. When it happens, you are, you are going to sit in the office until goodness knows when, especially if the application is really huge. Where is this happening? So what's wrong with this? This is actually perfectly fine if it's just one thread. Okay, you have a data view, you have an array. This is an int32 array, and I'm going to increment the value at uh, the zeroth index by one, console log it out. With one thread, that's fine. But think about what happens if it's two threads. Okay, this particular part here, Incrementing the value by one and then console logging it, that's not so straightforward because if you have two threads, what's, what can happen is this. I'm not saying it always happens, but you will see it happening at some point. Okay? That's a, actually a few operations. First, the CPU has to, the thread has to load the value uh, from the array. Then it has to increment the value by one, and then it has to console log the value. Right now, it has to store the value back into memory. Um, so that, that's actually three operations. What happens if in the other thread, these three operations interleave in this way? Okay? So what happens is these two threads, first thread reads the value, zero. Second thread reads the value, zero. Zero, right, in both threads. And then the first thread increments the value by one, so now it's one. Second thread increments the value by one, and both store. You don't get two, you get one. Okay, and that sometimes happens, sometimes it doesn't happen because the way in which the threads interleave the operations is not necessarily deterministic. Sorry, it's not deterministic. Okay, so yeah, it's it's not fun. Uh, we can actually see this in action. Let me find an example here. Counting threaded. Ah. Okay. So, I don't know if you can see the number here. Notice that the number that's returned, I'm actually trying to count up to 10 to the power of 5, or 10 to the power of 6, whatever the case is. It's not supposed to give you this funny number. Okay, if I run it again, it gives me a different number. What's going on here? Okay, I'm, I'm not getting back a consistent number, and that's because the script that I'm running is actually doing this. I'm actually running two workers, okay, and the only, the only part that's really uh, relevant here is this string here, because what the worker is doing is that it's looking at this shared array, and it's increment, it keeps incrementing the, the value by one, right? So it keeps loading the value, incrementing it by one, store back. In, uh, load the value, increment by one, store back. In fact, it's probably not even doing all that because the compiler optimizing this is probably going to just keep incrementing the value without storing it back first, which is why uh, you end up seeing values that are very much lower than 
what you want. And how do we remedy that? Okay, so where did that thing go? Whoops. Okay, so if you want to remedy that, um, what you want to do is this. Instead of directly incrementing it, use atomics. So I'm going to use atomics.add. Uh, I'm going to add it to this. I'm going to add something to this particular shared array. Um, at index 0, I'm going to add a value of 1 to it. Okay, And if I were to do this now, I get the expected value every single time. But you notice this has a performance cost uh, because right now it's taking 120 over milliseconds to, to finish, whereas previously it was taking uh, about 70 milliseconds. So this, hopefully this illustrates, you know, it's not um, concurrency, it's not, it's not a free performance uh, increase, right? In fact, it's actually, it's quite a bad idea if you have to keep operating on the same, um, same data from different threads, and you have to keep locking the thing using atomics, and that's going to slow down your, your program a lot. All right? Okay. So, well, when it comes to atomic operations, uh, I suppose you can read the API from, from M MDN or, or the Node.js documentations. Um, out of all this then, since we're, we don't have very much time left, what I have to say is, uh, Add and subtract, probably self-explanatory, right? You're going to add a value to the, to the shared array at this particular index, or you're going to subtract a value from it. You can load a value from the shared array. You can store a value there. You've also seen wait and notify. These are most likely what most people would use right, on a day-to-day -day basis when you work with multiple threads. Exchange, um, what this does is that it exchanges you it exchanges a value in the shared array. Okay, let's say I want to ex um, let's say the value at the shared array at this particular index. I want to change the value. Remember, because of multi-threading, I can't take out the value and then put it back. Because when I take out the value, somebody else must might have uh, put another value inside right after that before I put this value in. And that's going to lead to data inconsistencies. So atomic exchange, what it does is that it makes the exchange of the values atomic. That means either both of these operations happen together or they both fail together. I wish I had more good news about this. Compare exchange would have been really good. And you, if, uh, if you want to write locks for threads, that means you want to write mechanisms such that a particular thread can lock while other threads carry on and unlock itself when certain uh, conditions happen, you would want to use this particular method. But I can show you that this method actually has a chance of failing. It does not actually do what it's supposed to do sometimes. What it's supposed to do is it's supposed to compare, it's supposed to check a value right, at a particular index in the shared array. If that value matches what you think it is, it exchanges the value with something that you give it. Otherwise, it leaves it alone, right? This is what happens. This is what happened when I ran it. I think uh, about fifty odd times. Sometimes you see this. So the numbers you see here on the left are actually the the thread ID. It's the number of the thread. So all this, all I'm doing is I'm exchanging the value of zero uh, in in the shared array with the thread ID, and then I'm exchanging it back. Right, so the thread with ID two sees a value of zero, takes it out, and puts the value two into the array. Right, compare and exchange. Right, if it's zero, put my thread ID inside, and I take the zero out. So right now, the thread, uh, the value at index zero is two. Then thread three comes along and sees the array, sees what's at the the. Uh, it sees what's at this index in the array. It sees the value 2. It's not 0, right? So it doesn't do anything with it. There's no exchange. That's why the lock is still at the value 2. Thread 2 then goes back and changes it back, OK? My thread ID is inside, so it's value 2. So I'm going to change it to value 0. What's this about? Thread 3 now retrieves a lock of 
a log value of 4, but didn't thread 2 just set it to 0? So that's, that's not doing what it's, it's supposed to do. Something has gone wrong here. And at, at least so far, this is the only atomics operation that I've seen that can fail in this manner. Okay? And the scary thing is that it doesn't always do that. Uh, in fact, it will, it will actually run properly most of the time until it doesn't. And that's probably not what you want. So as far as uh, atomics operations goes, that's all I have to say about it. Uh, atomics load. How many threads should you use when you want to use concurrent Node.js? Um, if we had more time, I would have shown you. If you spawn 500 threads, you're actually <laughs> going to make your application very, very, very much slower. Um, so generally, keep in mind what your threads are doing. Optimally, one thread runs on each core. So if you have a quad core machine, um, spawn four threads, right? More threads is not always better, unless you know, unless you know that your threads are going to be idle most of the time. Yeah, then maybe you want to spawn another thread to, to do something else, OK? So passing data to threads, these are what we saw use, you can either use worker data to pass it at creation time, you can either use post message to pass it at runtime. Um, but if you really want it to be fast and you can design your application such that you avoid uh, concurrent reads and writes all the time, go ahead, use the shared ray buffer. Uh, we didn't have time to see text encoder, text decoder. But if you are working with strings and you want to pass it from one thread to, an, uh, one thread to another, you might want to consider using text encoder and text decoder to, to serialize the thing to the buffer. So finally, designing for concurrency is hard. Uh, if you are talking about the same task and the same data like what you saw just now with the counting, use a single thread for it, right? Don't waste resources. Don't keep creating threads. You actually have to terminate threads, otherwise they'll, they'll stay around. Okay, so don't waste resources. Uh, use a thread pool for it. Uh, use post message instead of serializing objects too often. Post message actually does the serializing for you and it's, it's very, very fast. And use atomics to synchronize access to shared array buffers. Um, as far as thread pools, well, how a thread pool might be implemented could be something, uh, okay, I, I don't think we can show all the code here, but you can find some packages in, in NPM, right? What this does is it allows me to do things like this. So at the start here, I create a pool. Initial size 4, let's say I, I can set the maximum size to 50. I can set the initial buffer size and so on and so forth, right? And then what this HTTP server does is that each time a request comes in, if it needs to do a lot of heavy processing for uh, if it needs to do a lot of heavy processing in order to service the request, to send a reply, it actually tells a worker to do this instead, right? Then it sends the reply and uh, it releases the worker back to the pool. So actually when I use this thread pool, I'm only ever going to have maximum 50 threads at any one point in time. And yeah, unfortunately I didn't, I, 30 minutes is up. <laughs> So I'm, yeah, unfortunately, I can't show very much else. But if you want to see performance uh, metrics, feel free to look for me later or something. OK? Yeah, so that's, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you.